Big round of applause for Krista, please. Come on. Okay, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Crate is um, and how it works with Docker. Um, and I'm going to attempt to give as many sort of demos as possible, but what we work with is quite complex, so the demos I give are often pretty uh, basic in comparison, but hopefully they'll illustrate something. A little bit about me first. Uh, I'm originally from London. I lived there 25 years and then moved to Melbourne in Australia for seven and a half years. And then I lived in uh, Leipzig and then Berlin in Germany. And we've been in Germany for a year, so I'm in the Berlin office. Um, I've been a professional musician. I've been a writer, but uh, I did a computer science degree before all that, and now I'm kind of back to my uh, developer roots. But I guess that's what makes me an advocate. Um, I'm not necessarily the best programmer in the world, but I'm good at talking to people, and I don't mind making a fool of myself in front of uh, audiences. So, um, but that said, if you have any really, really in-detail questions about our core product, then I don't develop it. So I may have to uh, defer to a later date, but I'm kind of more about helping people use the product and um, integrate with it, things like that. So I'll start with a couple of the introductory slides. A lot of this stuff is probably pretty obvious, but we'll just quickly, uh, quickly <coughs> run through it. Um, this is a container microservices type meetup. We're sort of all now really on the, uh, the path that our web applications, our application stacks, our um, infrastructure stacks are distributed. We're not putting everything in one place anymore. It's not particularly a new concept anymore. And that's, I guess I'm leading towards why uh, we created Crate in the first place, which is always a very hard sentence, created Crate. Um, and I guess um, this is a, a sort of concept borrowed from um, Adrian Cockroft, who is ex-Netflix, who's fairly well known um, in the kind of future of uh, uh, infrastructure type of space. Um, we started with data centers, which are great and serve a very functional and specific purpose, but whenever we needed to add capacity, we needed to build another data center. And that's not something anyone can just do overnight. It's pretty complicated. The people who have the skills are not necessarily around anymore, etc., etc. It's not easy to replicate. Then uh, came virtualization and cloud in commas. Um, not a new concept anymore, but that concept of a infrastructure of a, as a service, which was covered in some of the, the some in the previous talk, but that way of being able to access services as and when we need them. Then we get to containers. Of course, Docker is not the only one, as again we just saw, and I'll be blunt here, Crate doesn't just work with Docker either. We work very well with Docker, but we do work in um, other containers and without containers as well, but um, it's the, the one we probably work best with. And then we come to things like compute services. At the moment, this would be something like uh, AWS's Lambda. It's even sort of more stripped down than a container, just a discrete um, service that performs a discrete role. Things that come and go within microseconds, not even seconds, just to perform an action when needed and go away again. So this is the kind of um, the infrastructure that we're starting to program against, um, which has its, has its challenges. And from an application perspective, it's not too difficult, he says. <laughs> but from a database perspective, it's always been a little bit more complicated because it's a source of knowledge that we rely on. It's a source of knowledge that we want to be able to rely on it's a source of knowledge that we want to, to know is available and where what is. And when we've needed to scale this in the past, it's been difficult. It's not impossible, but it's been difficult. It's been a challenge. And I guess the traditional path that many have followed is you start with a traditional relationship, relationship, relational database, maybe MySQL. <laughs> you add things to it, which perform other functions. You add search on top. And it works, it's great. Then you need to add more capacity and it gets harder. Again, it's not impossible, but it's hard and it takes your time away from just making a good application. Um, and I guess the problem is compounded when it comes to containers. The very nature of containers is they're supposed to be ephemeral and not too valuable as it were. We can um, 
create and destroy them reasonably easily, but data and the persistence of data has always been a more difficult problem to solve. As we're doing that, how do we make sure that the data we're still storing and reading from is there? Um, and again, it's not impossible, but I guess this is why we started working with Crate, because we wanted to make something that made it easy. And that's, I guess, the, the, the defining factor. Um, so, the mountains come up here. The office was, uh, is originally, well, not originally, it's still there, but it's in a place called Dornbirn on the Swiss-Austrian border. Um, very nice place, but in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so, uh, it initially started out as a, actually some plugins to Elasticsearch. <coughs> Elasticsearch is kind of uh, a core component of what we've got here, and I'll show you that in a minute. But then as it developed, the team realized actually what was being added could be more than that, and um, started to build it into a more separate product. Um, and I say product because it's the kind of best word to use, but the, everything is actually 100% open source. Not only do we use existing open source components, what we create with those components is also fully open source. There's no difference between open source versions and enterprise versions. The only commerciality is premium support. So I use the word product, but it's not actually for sale per se. So be clear about that. So what is it? Um, and here comes some of, I guess, this is, a, this is a busy space. Some of the more unique points that we're aiming at, and a lot of it comes down to that uh, ease of use, that ease of people. I guess we're almost aiming at people who aren't in this room in some respects, people who are coming from a, uh, an application stack that is still leaning heavily on MySQL and is starting to break down. Um, so being able to use SQL is actually a big advantage. We're offering a lot of the kind of NoSQL benefits but you can actually use SQL to query it. That's kind of one of the, uh, where a lot of the work went into, and I'll show how that has been accomplished on a, an overall way in a minute. Um, we, it scales horizontally very easily. We use the concept that all the instances are equal to each other. There's no concrete concept of masters and slaves. There's a sort of a, a behind the scenes concept, and if you want to, in your setup, elect masters that are more important than other instances you can, but you don't necessarily need to. Uh, it will work without that concept in place. Um, and because of all the components in there, we're getting things like blob storage as well, um, full text storage, uh, and things like that. I guess the uh, we have largely aimed for speed and performance over uh, data consistency, so it's eventually consistent, which I will show examples of in a minute. And there's some negatives and positives to that, which I will sort of wrap up the presentation with. So, uh, and all yeah, the semi-structured, which I also got a very good demonstration of what that entails in a minute. So here's the component stack. The sort of grey-green on this screen is Elasticsearch components, so there's a fair bit of Elasticsearch in there. Um, there's some other third-party uh, libraries, and in the light blue is things we've contributed. So you can see here that we've got our own custom blob storage. The loose scene is for indexes, uh, and then Elasticsearch is handling everything else. Um, kind of up at the aggregation layer is where most of it's custom. So the ability to be able to query multiple instances of data to figure out where it is. Um, and I guess between the uh, query layer and the aggregation layer is kind of where a lot of the magic happens. Um, the parsing of SQL and matching it to the objects down here in a fast and performant way. Um, and some of the other useful elements are, which I will actually demonstrate is bulk import and export. A database needs data in it. Unless you're starting from scratch, you've probably got some somewhere else. How do you get things into it? And then things like a dashboard a shell interface, and then client libraries, which we'll see some of. Um, and preempting any questions that may come later, yes, we are aware of the previous problems of Elasticsearch, um, and they are largely solved from Elasticsearch's end now, and we're always using their latest version and help them solve a lot of those problems as well. So, so bang goes that question, sorry. <laughs> um, 
And just wrapping up the kind of ease of use, um, we have client libraries available. If that doesn't do the job for you, then um, there's an HTTP endpoint to run queries on normally. Um, some of these are ORM compatible as well. So the one of the PHP drivers, uh, the Rails driver, um, and there is a sort of alpha version Python Django driver as well, which are all ORM, so you can use those kind of framework concepts of uh, models to query data. Because there are a lot of these have been contributed by the community, feature sets are not consistent, but you always have the uh, HTTP endpoint to fall back on um, if all else fails. <laughs> so let's come to Docker, the familiar friendly uh, way or way. So, as you'd expect, it's reasonably easy to get started. We have an image on a Docker Hub. Um, we, everything I will show to you has been um, created through, a, through this Docker image. All of the admin interface and all of that component stack is all in that image. Um, I won't bother demonstrating this because I think this probably makes sense to pretty much everybody, but we're creating three instances there. I guess the important thing is to point out the difference between the first two and the third one. We have these two ports that we like to use. You don't necessarily need to, but they're just kind of standard in the crate stack. So what we do here is we manually set them and let Docker determine the ports in the other instances, but because we have um, service discovery, which we'll come to some of the complexities of that later, they'll find each other. Um, so it doesn't matter what ports the other two instances are running on, they'll discover each other anyway. So that would get you um, a three instance crate cluster running on in a matter of seconds, depending on your internet connection, of course. Slightly more complex example, and I will um, <coughs> use this then as a demonstration. Um, so this is, again, doing the port matching. We're setting a, a data volume on the local um, instance. So for example, in the demo I'm going to show you in a second, this is running on a, there's 12 AWS instances, each with a Docker um, VM running with a crate instance in it. It's quite a scale down there. But um, the advantage of setting the volume means that on the individual um, AWS instance, as we create and destroy uh, a container, the data is still there somewhere. So if you then recreate it, the new, um, the, the new crate node will discover what was previously there and then resynchronize with the rest of the, the cluster, which we'll come to. So it's a, one of the ways of getting persistence, certainly on the individual level anyway, and then you can rely on the cluster to rebalance itself. Um, and then in the final section, we have some actual crate configuration options. Uh, I guess the most important ones are these bottom three. We use um, service discovery quite a lot, um, obviously. And when you're not on the same host, which is pretty common, that is a problem, especially on a lot of cloud hosting. Um, and there's lots of solutions to this. Um, this is one of them which is a fairly tr sort of traditional way of doing it. You have a publish host, and then you set a list of the other hosts in the cluster, and then they're all aware of each other. Um, I'm also going to show you a demo, a demo later with Weave, which is another way of doing it. Um, Docker itself is starting to solve this problem, but it's still um, in a kind of early release. And we now actually have DNS discovery built into the latest versions of Crate. But I only got told this by our core team last week, when I'd already made these presentations. <laughs> so so we've actually, there's actually kind of a, a multiple ways you could potentially get the service discovery to work now across multiple hosts, but I'm going to stick to these methods for now. So quickly, excuse me, I keep getting a static shock every time I come back. Yeah, so <laughs> okay, let's jump out of this and I'll quickly demonstrate this and it'll show you the, uh, the um, cluster rebalancing as well. Where I should remember what this. Da, 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 da. Okay. 
So, first demo. We have over here, this is Amazon. Currently, actually currently with 11 nodes, I like that. So this is the admin interface that comes as default. We have, it's, you know, you probably wouldn't use it very often in an actual production environment, but it just gives you an overview of the health of data and what's going on. The version <coughs> at the top, we're actually now up to 0.49, the number of nodes at the moment, an overview of the data. So this is a reasonably large data set. Um, we have, uh, geez, <laughs> we have a console where you could run some basic queries. We have an overview of the tables, and in this one it's also showing you the partitions of the data and the schema of the data, um, and then an example of the cluster. Okay, so, um, I might just talk very loudly for a minute whilst I put this down. So, what I'm going to do, I want you to keep an eye on that Why Mac OS does not have a keyboard shortcut for turning mirroring on. Yes, yes, it does. It does. What is it? Command F1. Right. Okay, I'm going to try that in a second. That is incredibly useful to know. <laughs> okay. So keep an eye on that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So keep an eye on that as I destroy the translucent background. So I um, I'm in my um, one of the instances. I do. See it here. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> you know, I'm used to having pink through one hand. <laughs> <laughs> so we kill it. And you'll notice in the background, I've got an. Oh no, well, I think I've killed the, the main one. <laughs> the one it's running on, which was a great demo. Okay. <laughs> well, that's um, that's actually okay. We can we can we can uh, we can still come back from this, just in a slightly more drastic way. <laughs> uh, somewhere in the patch history, you hope. Depends who else has been using this demo. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> I hope Joe will fail. Okay. We can see though that 100% of data is still available, but it's not completely replicated yet. We had about 50 gig of data, but it's pretty quick in re-replicating. Um, and this is a good... Ow! <laughs> <laughs> How did you not get a static shot for the last speaker? I, I did. Must be my shoes. I've got to stop moving around, I think. Um, and so they're starting to re-replicate, but just to show you a couple of quick queries, to point out some of the um, SQL kind of commands that are there. 
So, for example, sort of aggregation type functions uh, and to operate to demonstrate a. Um, so, that was, we have 50 gig of data, we're looking at the steps taken by a particular user in a particular month. Um, it's limiting in there as well, but we could take that off. Um, and we queried that data in um, 0.04 seconds whilst the cluster is still rebalancing as well. So, I guess that's the, uh, the demonstration of the rebalancing. Um, which is all very well and good. Let's actually look at how we get kind of started getting to this point. But that's a quick demonstration of the, the SQL and the um, clustering features. So, uh, and the self-healing, as it's, as it's called. Okay, I might just stay off and keep it here. Okay, so I'm going to jump into a couple of other Docker components now to, um, to demonstrate some other things. So, hopefully you can see that, that's reasonably clear, yeah. So this is just a bash script, bits and pieces in here. This is a different demo where we're actually using the uh, GitHub archive data. This is every commit of every hour, of every day, of every month, of every year in the history. Um, this demo is not going to download that much. Is that, I'm actually going to do this on my laptop, which can sometimes break my laptop. It did last night, so... <laughs> so, so um, so I'm only downloading 10 days of last month at the moment. Um, but then a little bit later we'll, we'll up that a bit. But yeah, just to give you an idea, the reason it's a, um, a good data set as well is it has lots of nested objects. And um, Crate supports objects in its schema. But one of the great things, as you might see here, is we've just declared one, two, three objects and nothing else. We're not actually worrying about the properties of those objects and the fact that some of them are nested. The interesting thing with the GitHub data is depending on the type of repository, depending on the action, all the data is different in each row. Like it's a very inconsistent data set. So it's a good one to kind of demo with. Um, so I've got a Docker Compose file with a whole bunch of containers, which I'll show you in a minute. We drop the table if it exists just because this is a demo, so this makes me start from a fresh slate. We create the table and then we copy a bunch of, uh, it's uh, gzipped. I'm now really reluctant, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to stand still for now. <laughs> okay, so and in our um, Docker Compose file, which is just a way of um, just illustrating how we could kind of orchestrate this all. I was just basically trying to create a demo. I could make something happen in one command to demonstrate a few things. We have uh, three create instances, kind of doing a similar thing to the other demo, one with the ports set, set, set manually and two allowing it to happen dynamically. We're mounting the uh, volume that has the gzip JSON files on my computer into the container. I'm just taking it to each one, just to be sure it's there, but we could just do it to one and send the, the query to, to just that one. Um, I'm setting a heap size because importing data can be a little bit memory intensive. In a real world example, you'd be setting something to a lot higher than one gigabyte, but this is just my laptop, so I've kept it reasonably low. And then I'm building a whole application stack. I'm actually using Laravel, which is a PHP framework. Firstly, because I come from a PHP background, but secondly, uh, because the guy who made the adapter for it did a really good job, and it's just a nice demonstration. But one of the other interesting things here, just as a kind of example of linking Docker containers, is to install Laravel, you need Composer, which is um, PHP's kind of package manager. So we actually need to set a connection between the two, so one can install the other, <laughs> and then run the code. It's sort of a kind of interesting interconnection of uh, containers, and theoretically, you could then probably get rid of one of them at the end of it all. But, and then we link them to the, just to create one, because it's a cluster and they're self-aware, it doesn't matter which one we connect it to and link it to, as long as it can access one, it can access all of them. So, let's keep our fingers crossed that this is going to, I'm actually not going to run the bash script because um, I have imported the data already, which is what already always kills my machine. So I'm going to cheat slightly tonight. 
<laughs> uh, check you in the right folder. script. Oh, I know what I'm thinking. Give me one sec. I may have to rerun it actually. We'll see in a second. It doesn't matter too much. We'll see what happens. Okay. Oh, there. Good. So it's rebalancing. One of the nodes still hasn't kind of joined the cluster. We just did. It's good. And we also saw all the data rebound. It says 56,000 records. It's not crazy, but this is on my local laptop, so I'm playing it safe. <laughs> um, and to have a look at the schema. So in a real world, you'd probably partition this and all sorts of other things. But just to give that example here, especially as we go down, you could see that in those objects, all the fields got auto-generated for us. And as we look down this, we may see that some of them maybe weren't correct. Maybe they should have been ints instead, maybe they should have been timestamps instead of strings, etc, etc. And we could hard define that scheme if we wanted to, but it's just a demonstration of the fact that we did very little and we can get a whole bunch of data imported with, oops. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first time she's done that as well. <laughs> um, it's a problem with Hangouts, it's because it's in the browser, you can't really uh, mute it. Um, anyway, so there we go. And I have uh, the Laravel application. I'll just, this is actually the. So, this is a really, really amazing UI of. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> of just. Um, basically, what I'm doing here is I'm going to. Now, our next step is I'm going to show you a mobile application that's using the data. And in an application stack, you wouldn't just give. Uh, any user just raw connection to a database. You would have something in the middle kind of providing authentication, filtering, and things like that. So that's basically what the, the Laravel application is doing. And then we're going to use the mobile application to query the Laravel application and just filter by events. This is just showing you um, a whole bunch of paginated records in here. And that. Uh, JSON there is the JSON we're going to return to the Android application. And so I have an Android application here. The emulator is not as slow as it used to be, but it takes a minute. So I will start it and I'll talk you through. So it's reasonably straightforward. We have the, it's actually not the correct URL. So before it starts, I should change that. So it just um, uses uh, the current preferred method in, um, in Android, which is Google's Volley library for sort of network communications to um, make a request, <laughs> set the type of uh, event it's looking for, and then again make a really awesome interface. <laughs> uh, and that's coming. Maybe we'll just leave it there. I think you probably understand. So you can see what's going to happen. I mean, the, the anticipation is probably not worth the, uh, <laughs> the, the result, but, just, but you get the idea. Um, so it's just a very quick, simple example to show how we downloaded a bunch of data and created a whole bunch of Docker containers that are all interrelated to each other. There you go. That's it. Yeah. So just the push events. Again, an amazing interface. Hey, it's back end stuff, so who cares? Um, so just a very quick example to show how you can do something reasonably quickly then. So, this is great, um, but as we alluded to, generally you're not running application stacks on one laptop. It's a bit more complicated than that, unfortunately. Um, so how do we handle some of that more um, cross machine, cross-virtual machine communication. As I said, the method that we currently use and 
we've sort of been working, they came to one of our hack events, the guys from Weaveworks, uh, six months or so ago, so we've sort of usually have used them to solve this problem in the, for the time being, but now there are some other options available. But it's a, it's, so what we're going to work with here, I have um, three Google Compute instances down here, three different IP addresses. I've set this one up because it's a fairly tedious setup and just watching it installing itself is not very interesting. But um, I'll quickly talk you through how we do it. We create the Google Compute instances and you can see at the bottom there and each sort of setup would have an equivalent method of doing this. We have a user script which does a bunch of things like um, install Docker, <laughs> download Weave, things like that. And Google Compute especially made this quite difficult, which is why I decided to pre-set up the demo, because some of the security stuff they put in place makes it difficult to do live, actually. So then we log into each machine and launch Weave, and then from subsequent launches, we connect it to the initial one. So it's basically creating kind of a software networking layer. Then we start Crate. Most of this is familiar. Some of the syntax is slightly different. Weave kind of sits on top of Docker, so theoretically you can use Weave to run most of your things and they communicate. Um, we are using, in each case we set the 10.0.1.1 to 1.2.1.3 in this example. It would be different in other examples. And again we set the kind of publish host and things like that, the cluster name. Uh, then we expose the Weave network. Then for Google Compute in particular we allow our ports through the firewall, otherwise they won't discover each other. And then, the end result is always an anticlimax, because it just looks like every other demo. <laughs> but, <laughs> but trust me, if you look at that IP address, so 5329, it's this one down here, um, running a create cluster. There's no data in here at the moment, so let's... In this case, I'm doing pretty much exactly the same thing I did before, but I'm copying it from um, an S3 bucket. It's just sort of easier in this case than trying to copy the data from somewhere else into the container, especially a big data set, because then it's sort of there in the container for no particular purpose afterwards. So we're copying it from an S3 bucket in this case. And this one is a bit bigger, but, and the annoying thing is it gives me, oh, I just create a table first, that's it. This is the second, this is a new demo for me, and I'm still uh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Forgetting a few steps. There we go. Create the table. Okay. The odd thing and annoying thing with this is it gives me an error. But it actually is working. There we go. <laughs> so, so it's a bit faster, he says. It doesn't actually seem to be as fast as it was yesterday, but it's a little faster. This one has got a bigger data set, but we could see it importing as we go, which is quite cool. Um, and theoretically, if we then connected that Laravel application to this, as we kept refreshing that, we would see the records there changing as well. But it's jumping up quite quickly there now. Um, but, yeah, it's kind of what you'd expect to see happen, I guess. Uh, and if we look in the table, we're seeing it come in. And I've not done any partitioning or anything like that on this. Theoretically, we'd probably partition it by year or month or something like that. Um, but there we go. So we've imported that data and we've distributed, okay, albeit it's probably a data center somewhere, but still it's distributed. And we have clients who are doing this across data centers, across geolocation, geographic locations. So it still works that distributed as well. So wrapping up, we've had a look at the feature set and um, it looks very positive, but let's have a look at the use cases where we actually use this. So as I said, we've aimed primarily at uh, performance over the consistency. So it's not well suited to systems that require transactional consistency. You wouldn't use it for financial records, for example, where you need to guarantee that every query is processed in a certain order, uh, in a certain way, etc., etc. As you can see there, we've kind of got queries happening all over the place and sorting it out, um, which for a lot of use cases works, but in some use cases it is not, that's not acceptable. And strong relational data. That said, um, one of the things we don't have from the SQL world at the moment is joins. But 
they are being worked on at the moment. They're actually in an alpha release at the moment, and we're even recruiting beta testers to test the joins for us. It's taken a while because it really affects performance. So we're even introducing the kind of join concept into distributed NoSQL databases as well. Um, if you need them. There are ways around using joins, but they're coming very soon. So what is it suitable for? Things like high volume and semi-structured data that changes all the time. Um, we have a lot of clients who are marketing intelligence, business intelligence, sensor data, uh, network security, meta, lots of gathering of metadata, I guess, on other processes and things like that. So, uh, and that's where a lot of our clients are at the moment, including a couple of large uh, network security and um, infrastructure provider companies as well, who are kind of gathering the data from their <coughs> hardware. So that's where it fits, I guess. And that is me largely done. You can stay in touch with us. You can obviously look on GitHub, talk to us in various sort of support channels. And the last slide is uh, that one, which we already talked about. So, <laughs> so, so yeah. Uh, thanks very much. And if you have any questions, I will do my best to answer them. Questions for Chris? Yes, sir. You say eventually consistent. Um, but what if you write to one node? So inserts and reads uh, from the same node, so the closest one, for instance. Then it's consistent, or isn't it? It would be consistent on that node. It would still then be eventually consistent across the cluster, of course. So it would be workable yeah. for applications that need yeah. it to be consistent. A lot, a lot of the kind of auto-magic features we've added on top can be bypassed if you want to. Yeah. Um, and some people do, for certain reasons. So a lot of that can be bypassed. Even the SQL parser can be bypassed if you want to. So, <laughs> so, so there's lots of things you can bypass and customize. And there's pages of configuration options, which we saw like six of. So yeah, you can do things like that if you want to. Yeah, thank you. Um, how does create distribute the data on the cluster? So, um, do you distribute it based on, on, on function or on, uh, on what you can? There's, um, I guess, to my knowledge, there's um, two main ways. There's your own manual partitioning, which you would do at the creation time in the schema. Um, we also do have some auto sharding as well, uh, and there is a default amount of sharding going on, which again can be configured. Um, and I had lost track of your question. Sorry. Well, uh, it, it, the default one, for example, that, how does it do? It just spreads everything evenly, or it's it's a question that we get asked a lot. Even when I've asked our core developers, they kind of tell me, "Oh, it just happens." <laughs> so, 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 so um, it's it's, like, it's always a question I get asked every time, and I really want a better answer than that. But at the moment, that's still kind of the best answer I have, in that it gets spread fairly evenly, <laughs> automatically, um, and you could see. I've got to go back to the static. You could see. For example, up the top here, the different instances do have different loads. So there's obviously, it's not completely even. There's a little bit of, um, of uh, balancing in different directions going there. And that said, you can elect extra masters if you wanted to. So if you had, depending on your network, network setup, if you had one computer on an extremely reliable infrastructure that you wanted to designate as taking the bulk of the load and the others can kind of be more of a backup, then you could do something like that and still benefit from a lot of the other functionality as well. But generally out of the box, I think it has a predefined amount of shards and just works a lot of it out. Um, and I really want to have a better answer to that question because I get asked this a lot, but it's, it's fairly automated unless you dig into the configuration. And it is there. A lot of the configuration is exposed. So okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Is it based on the sharding of Elastic? Um, Actually, that would be that. Because that would answer most of people's questions. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 I can't even see it. Someone's read it for me. There it is. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah.
Yes, um, with some, I think with some tweaking from the layer above with the distribution that has been contributed based on other factors. But it's largely leaning on, it's leaning on a lot of Elasticsearch, but with some extra things added on top. Who would you say is your uh, closest competitor in your terms of technology, and what is your advantage? We do have a few. It's a fairly busy space. Um, from a technological advantage, I would say it's the, probably the SQL um, for certain users. That doesn't, that's not important to everybody, but for the kind of people we're aiming at, it's important. Um, the second one would be the ease of horizontal scaling. And the third one is, we're probably the only European one. My <laughs> 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 local produce. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the first two are probably the most important. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. Would you be a player in the world of uh, semantic data? Of semantic data, linked data. Someone asked, story. Yeah, someone asked me that question before and I never really got in an opportunity to um, talk to them about it. Um, how, much, how, much, uh, how much would that be reliant on relational? Uh, just, just a little bit, uh, so, not at all actually. Yeah, probably should be fine. Yeah. I, I think it would be a very good use case. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> Uh, I can't necessarily think off the top of my head of anyone, any of our like the clients I walk around in my knowing that we have in my head that he's doing that, but I wouldn't see why it wouldn't be a good use case. So why would you fo focus on the SQL world? So? Why? Yeah. Just because um, there's a lot of them out there. Um, I guess our our founders and a lot of the team that they initially brought with them came from working for a couple of big German social networks where they had scaling problems all the time and they learned like the pains of scaling MySQL and they wanted to create something that helped with that but also helped the kind of DBAs who are still know SQL so well for creating applications and querying applications and things like that. Um, I think that's the main reason. That, I guess an audience like this is a lot of people are kind of like uh, we're moving forwards, who cares about what people did 10 years ago, but there's still a lot of people who have to, or want to, or just that's their mindset. So I guess it's aiming at kind of bringing a lot of the, the new cool features <coughs> and technologies to that audience, and that's, I guess, why. And so, so basically, easy scaling. In terms of? Easy scaling of uh, SQL. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is that the underlying bottom is not SQL, so that's, <laughs> so it's, it's, so that's why, I suppose. It's not SQL, it just lets you use SQL. Yeah. That's kind of the, the interesting thing. We're not storing SQL, it's letting you query with SQL. Does that make sense? With us a little bit. Yeah. Any more for any more? Yes, so well, it's a very simple question. How do you compare it to Cassandra? <laughs> That's the one we usually get compared to. <laughs> and I always forget the answer. Um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Cassandra is great for write, but not so much for read. It requires more constrained and schema definitions. Crate offers outstanding full text search, simple interface, cluster assigning. Also, everybody, powerful concurrent reason, right? So, flip it to go by an angle, so it doesn't change any time. So, what about my SQL and Cassandra as Bethan? I think you're already starting to get to the kind of um, the, 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 the links of, of my knowledge with, with this world. I'm sort of new to a lot of this world. Uh, I guess I'm better at uh, talking on the, the, uh, the, the higher level. But, um, in fact, actually, that is, I think, there was or is somewhere above this or on another page about that kind of very concept. We go back to one of the initial slides and yes, but then you've got two components again, which as you start to scale, you have to worry about the sharding and replicating. So, nice try. 
Just <laughs> falling at the legs. <laughs> <laughs> We've got one more question. Yes, Nails. I'm joking. Oh, right. <laughs> no, don't throw things. Don't pass that back. So, um, actually, this slide is amazing. No, yeah, this slide. We can see a lot of parts of Elasticsearch. Yeah. Um, I think most of us have read the Elasticsearch Call Me Maybe blog. Are you in contact with Jepson to, or like the, the guy behind it, to run Jepson on top of Crate.io? And, and yeah. Um, as I alluded to this earlier, but in terms of a direct, directly getting him to 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 run his tests. No, I guess, unfortunately, at the moment, in the grand scheme of things, we're too small a fish for him to pay much attention. I think he did take a look at some point, but I guess the strong Elasticsearch component just probably kind of didn't seem worthwhile to him, maybe, because it considers it already tested, maybe, fundamentally. Um, but that said, all the updates that they released to solve some of those problems are here. Unless you're running a very old version of Crate, you're going to be having the up-to-date version of Elasticsearch as well. That have fixed most of those issues, or all of them, if not. And in terms of getting him to actually run it himself, it would be good. I was once at the same conference with the guy, but I never got a chance to, uh, to grab him, unfortunately. <laughs> so was, maybe next time, because it would be, that would be a very good uh, set of approval. So, yeah. But um, it shouldn't be a problem. Unless you depend on Elasticsearch, because they still don't pass it. They, they don't pass it at the moment. They still? They still don't pass it. OK. okay. Well, on that bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nils. Let's have a big round of applause for Chris Ward.